All right, kiddos, welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion about intermolecular forces. We're going to wrap up some hydrogen bonding discussion by maybe just doing a sample problem for you. I'm going to start example two, and then I want you guys to do the other two parts of example two on your own. So let's say I wanted to draw molecules of water and show the locations of hydrogen bonds between the molecules. Remember, Hydrogen bonds are not within the water molecule, but they are between the water molecules. So let's draw a water molecule here, H, O, H. We know water is a bent molecule. And of course, there are non-bonding electron pairs on that oxygen to complete its octet. And of course, we know that there's a concentration of electrons around the oxygen end of that molecule. Um, and a... Uh, deficiency of electrons around the hydrogen end. So this end is negative, and these would be positive, wouldn't they? In fact, we call that a bare proton because the uh, electron that normally buzzes around hydrogen's nucleus is now spending most of its time around oxygen. So how would I orientate the other water molecule? Yeah, I'd probably do something like this, where the hydrogen in the neighboring molecule is going to be orientated towards the oxygen in the other molecule. And so we'd have that positive uh, proton, bare proton, being attracted to the negative end of the neighboring oxygen molecule. Let's go ahead and show that hydrogen bond in orange. So that would be my H bond here. That would be my hydrogen bond between two water molecules. Now why don't you take a minute and do the same thing for ammonia and for one water molecule and for one ammonia molecule. Now if you forgot what ammonia is, kiddos, remember it's NH3, nitrogen trihydride. So pause the video, try those two, and then come back and we'll see how you did. All right, uh, welcome back. So we have two ammonia molecules. So let's go ahead and maybe draw it something like this. You know that ammonia is a trigonal pyramidal structure, right? With a non-bonding pair here, concentration of electrons on that nitrogen. And the hydrogens are bare protons. They have a positive over here. So I'd probably draw the next ammonia molecule something like this, wouldn't I? where that positive hydrogen is going to be attracted to that negative end uh, um, on the neighboring uh, ammonia molecule. So let's go ahead and show the hydrogen bond. It would be right there between the hydrogen in one molecule and the uh, nitrogen in the other. So that would be the H bond there. Okay, what did you do for one water molecule and for one ammonia molecule? Well, let's take a look. What if I drew my water like this? my negative end of the water molecule and my positives for my hydrogens and then the ammonia I might orientate something like this. There's my negative and I have my positives here for my hydrogen and my hydrogen bond kiddos would be um, right here between that oxygen and the water molecule and the hydrogen in the ammonia and so that would be my hydrogen bond. Okay, how did you do on those two? All right, good for you. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about this uh, force. It's called a network covalent bond. Now, these are the strongest types of bonds. Um, and we can call them intermolecular forces. The most common example that you'll see is, is diamond and you'll also see graphite. You should know that diamond and graphite are elemental carbon. They are simply carbon atoms. They are what we call allotropes. Now, allotropes are different forms of the same element. There's another allotrope of carbon called Buckminster fullerene, which somewhat applies to our discussion here, but I'm just showing you the different types of structures we can have for the same element. So if you take a look at diamond, this is a carbon atom here, and you'll notice that it's bonded to a carbon atom right beneath it. That bond right there is between a, is, is created by a shared pair of electrons. 
that's actually a covalent bond. Those are very, very strong. They are much stronger than the intermolecular bonds like hydrogen bonding and dipole to dipole that we've been talking about. Now take a look at this carbon atom right here. It's covalently bonded to the one above, to these three below, aren't they? Isn't it? So those are all covalent bonds there. So it's very difficult to remove a carbon atom from this diamond crystal, from that structure. That's why diamond is so hard. And so these folks, these types of uh, substances, have extremely high melting points, and they have extremely high boiling points. They don't evaporate very easily. Not at all. You would hate for that to happen. After all, that's once again why we say diamonds are forever. Now, graphite, an allotrope of carbon, is a little bit different. Um, we have layers of carbon atoms. So this is a carbon atom here, and you can see it's covalently bonded to this carbon atom and this carbon atom. Here's a carbon atom over here. It's covalently bonded to this one and this one. Uh, this carbon atom is covalently bonded to this one, this one, and this one. Those are very, very, very strong bonds, and they're very, very difficult to break. So it also has high melting and boiling points. But the interesting thing about graphite, at least I think it's interesting, is that this is a layer, and those carbon atoms are covalently bonded together within the layer. But between layers, there are LDFs. So there's an LDF attracting these carbons in the top layer to the carbon atoms in the layer below. These are LDFs, London Dispersion Forces. And remember, kiddos, those are relatively weak forces. So within the layer, we have very, very strong covalent bonds. But between layers, we have these very, very weak uh, LDFs, London Dispersion Forces. Now, the best example I can think of is a pencil. We always call it pencil lead, don't we? But in reality, the pencil lead that we have is graphite. And if you were to take your pencil point and just drag it lightly across your paper, you would leave a dark mark, wouldn't you? Actually, a very light mark. Well, what you're actually breaking are these LDFs between the layers of carbon atoms. And so we're leaving layers, these layers right here on our paper. And it's very easy to break those LDFs, London Dispersion Forces, between the layers. All right, in Buckminster Fullerene, you can see, if you were to take, to take a look at this molecule here, this carbon atom is covalently bonded to these here. So those are all network covalent. Those are the strongest of all. And these guys have very high melting points, very high boiling points, and they do not evaporate easily at all. Okay? So let's list our intermolecular forces so far. If we did that, we have number one. Um, we have LDFs. And you might want to go back and review that. Hopefully you know what they are. Number two, dipole to dipole. Number three, hydrogen bonding. Good job. Now, I'm going to leave this network covalent here as number six, because there's actually two others that we've talked about, and I'm not sure if you remember. Number four, ionic. Yeah, we have positive ions attracted to negative ions. That electrostatic force of attraction, the ionic bond, is also a force of attraction between particles within a solid. And we talked about lattice energy earlier. And then number five, metallic bonding, which we sort of glossed over in an earlier unit where we talked about uh, positive ions, positive metallic ions, cations, um, within, um, within a crystalline structure. And their valence electrons are able to flow freely throughout that crystalline structure. So we have LDFs, dipole to dipole, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, metallic bonding, and then the strongest of all, network covalent. Okay? All right, let's talk about phase changes now. We talk about phase changes, kiddos. We're talking about changes from solids to liquids to gases. So 
Let's take a look at the left of this diagram here where I have a nice, pretty, crystalline, solid structure here. See how those atoms are nice and neatly organized? These little yellow marks here, or orange marks, are supposed to show that those atoms are vibrating around a fixed point. And it looks as though they're vibrating left to right, but they're also vibrating up and down and forwards and backwards. So they're actually vibrating in all directions. That's their kinetic energy. They are moving, but they're stuck together in this crystalline lattice, either by, let's see, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, metallic bonding, or network covalent, or any of those forces that we talked about. And they have this neat um, crystalline structure. Well, we know that if we add energy um, to the solid, we can actually separate those particles, and we can cause them to be a liquid. And so they won't have a definite shape anymore. They can flow. Remember we said they can flow. They can move past one another. And so they are not quite as close to each other. There's a little room here, but if for all intents and purposes, you know, we can't compress that anymore. And if we were to heat, uh, heat the liquid up, add even more energy, we could separate those particles even farther from each other and turn them into a gas. So going from a solid to a liquid, to a gas, is an endothermic process that requires energy. We have to add energy uh, to go from a solid to a liquid, and then to go from a liquid to a gas. It's also possible to go directly from a solid to a gas. So let's take a look at that in my illustration. Here's my solid, and here's my gas. If I add enough energy, I can go directly from the solid phase uh, to the gas phase, to, 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 to the gas phase, and that's called sublimation. And these all require energy; they are endothermic. Now it turns out that the energy to go from a solid to a liquid, plus the energy to go from a liquid to a gas, is equal to the energy to go from a solid to a gas directly. Okay. Now what if we went in the opposite direction? Okay, so let's go ahead and change colors here. What if we went in the opposite direction? What if we started with a gas and went to a liquid? So now we're going from a gas to a liquid. Okay, now that's called condensation. Now, if it consumed energy when I went from a liquid to a gas, it would seem to me that it would give off energy if I went from a gas to a liquid. And that would make sense. These particles need to lose kinetic energy to be able to get nice and close to each other and condense. And the same is true when I go from a liquid to a solid. That would also lose or give off energy. We call that an exothermic process. So going from a liquid to a solid would give off energy as well. Well, can we go directly from a gas to a solid? A gas directly to a solid. Let's take a look at our diagram. Here's my gas, and I can go directly to a solid if I take away or lose enough energy. And that's called deposition, which is the opposite, of course, of sublimation. So this process right here, these are what we call exothermic. They have to lose or give off energy. And then the process down below, these guys right down here, these are called um, endothermic. They require energy to make that change. They're opposites of each other. Now, just to wrap this up for the day, in a given sample of a liquid at a given temperature, the average kinetic energies of all molecules is constant. So the average kinetic energies is constant. In actual fact, the actual individual kinetic energies, and I'm just going to abbreviate kinetic energies with Ke kiddos, varies greatly. In order for a molecule of a liquid to actually evaporate, or to be in the vapor or gaseous state, so to go from the liquid to the gaseous state, two conditions must be met. We're going to talk about this next time. Number one, that molecule or particle to evaporate must be on the surface of the liquid.
and number two, it must have the minimum kinetic energy needed to break the intermolecular forces of attraction between those liquid particles. Okay, we'll talk more about this next time and try to understand the graph below. So we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.